Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you all to today's webinar, Six Mega Trends Reshaping Independent Educational Consulting. This session is being recorded, and the archive will be posted to the UCI Division of Continuing Education On Demand Recordings page. My name is Lisa Huang, and I'm a program manager here at UCI DCE. Here is a brief outline of what we are going to cover in this webinar session. First, I'll start off with a quick overview of Zoom features so you'll know how to submit questions throughout the presentation. Next, I'll be giving you some information about our Independent Educational Consultant Certificate Program, which is a fully online program. I will cover the requirements, fees, and details regarding upcoming courses for our spring quarter, which begins April 1st. I will then turn it over to our guest presenter, Mark Scaro. At the end of his presentation, we will have a brief Q&A session. And finally, I'll leave you with my contact information so that you can send us any additional questions that we didn't address. If you encounter any technical difficulties during the webinar today, please send a chat message over to UCI support Eric, and he will help you troubleshoot any issues. If you have a question for Mark regarding the content of this presentation, please feel free to submit it in the chat panel, and we will address it at the end if we have time. Now, in the chat panel, be sure that you send your either questions or comments to all panelists and attendees, and that'll ensure that everyone logged into the session uh, can see your response coming through. Here's a brief overview of the Independent Educational Consultant Certificate Program. Our program provides the knowledge and skills needed to fully understand the college admissions process and how to meet the needs of varied clients. Developed and taught by industry experts and accomplished educational consultants, you will also acquire the basic skills required to start, open, and expand a successful and ethical educational consulting business. Our program is designed for a number of audiences. Currently, we have individuals who have transitioned into the college admissions consulting profession from other careers like, like high school college counseling or administration, individuals looking to develop their business model and marketing plan in order to launch their own private practice. We also have people who are already practicing IECs but are seeking professional development opportunities. The certificate program is composed of five required courses and two electives, which add up to seven courses or 15 units total. To be eligible for this certificate, students must complete all seven courses with a letter grade of C or better, as well as a completed declaration of candidacy form. Now, since there is a small candidacy fee, I usually advise students to take a few classes before they apply, just to make sure that they want to complete the full program. So as I mentioned before, our certificate program consists of seven online courses. The five required courses are listed below. We have principles of educational consulting, navigating the financial aid network, college admissions consulting resources, developing an independent educational consulting business, and the independent educational consulting practicum. We highly recommend that new students start with the principles course during their first quarter. There is a prerequisite for the practicum course. You must complete all of the other required courses before enrolling in the practicum. We also offer a, a number of electives, working with students with learning differences, marketing and PR for the educational consultant, consulting transfer summer and gap year students, American college consulting for the international student, international college consulting for the American student, and fundamentals of graduate school admissions. In the upcoming spring quarter, we will be offering all of the required courses, so the principles course, financial aid, resources, developing an IEC business, and the IEC practicum. Each course is listed here with its start and end date, as well as the online course fee of $695 per course. Registration is currently open, and students may enroll either online or by calling our student services office at the number provided. Courses in this program tend to fill up very quickly, so early registration is recommended. And here are the electives being offered in spring 2019, Consulting Transfer Summer and Gap Year Students and International College Consulting for the American Student. Again, the start and end dates of the course are listed as well as the course fee. The course schedule and enrollment information are also posted on our website. Each course in the program costs $695, so you're looking at $4,865 in course fees for the seven online courses. Now, you don't pay the entire total upfront. You would simply pay for each course individually at the time of enrollment. 
There is also a $125 certificate candidacy fee for the program. So in the end, you're looking at just under $5,000 for the total. Now, please note that amount does not include textbooks, which some courses may require. Textbook information is posted on the enrollment page, so you'll know if course materials are required before you enroll in a class. Here's some information about the discount we provide to members of HECA and IECA. Members of these associations are given a 10% discount on courses within our Independent Educational Consultant Certificate Program. For membership questions or to receive the discount code if you are already a member, please follow directions on our website. And this is a screenshot of our IEC certificate program brochure. If you do not have the brochure, you can download it off of our website. And similar to the website, the brochure contains general information about the certificate program and course descriptions. When viewing the course schedule, you'll, no you'll notice that not all classes are offered every quarter, so please plan accordingly. Today's presenter is Mark Sclaro, CEO of IECA, who also happens to be one of the founding advisory committee members for our certificate program. We are very excited to have him logged in today to present on the topic, Six Megatrends Reshaping Independent Educational Consulting. So at this time, I'm gonna go ahead and hand the remote control over to Mark so that he can begin his presentation. Mark, can you hear us okay? I can hear you just fine, thank you, Lisa. Wonderful, <laughs> feel free to take it away. Thank you very much. So I, I do want to thank Lisa, and, and, and I want to remind folks that UC Irvine still is the country's only certificate program specifically for independent educational consultants. And, and thanks for acknowledging that I've been there from the beginning. I, IECA, uh, from inception to today, has very much been a part of the program, and we're thrilled uh, to have been able to do that. I also want to thank everybody. Uh, for, for being uh, online, taking a break from your Michael Cohen testimony that's going on. Uh, if I have any goal today, it's to be a little less contentious than Congress is uh, uh, throughout the morning, at least, uh, of the testimony. Uh, a couple of uh, little things. Uh, you'll see that we are going to keep the chat room open. Uh, I think that uh, Lisa very nicely said, so you can see other people's comments and thoughts. For me, if I begin to bore myself, uh, I can read your questions and comments and, and have a little bit of fun that way. For those that don't know me, uh, I have been the Chief Executive Officer of the Independent Educational Consultants Association for 26 years. Uh, so I like to say that, that I've been there uh, in this field of independent educational consulting from infancy to adulthood. Uh, although maybe more like adolescence than adulthood. Uh, but uh, we're certainly, um, I've been able to see those trends develop. And when I developed the trends for today's presentation, I would note a couple of these things are brand new. Uh, I think that you'll, you'll note things that I really haven't spoken about before. And some are more of, of an evolution. Uh, things that I've spoken about over the years, but I will hope to update and give a little more information about how things have evolved, how they're changing, and what's going on. And I hope that makes sense, because as you might imagine, uh, some trends may just, it, it may result from things that pop up, other trends result uh, from things that emerge over time. Uh, so let, let's start uh, with the big picture. Uh, and Lisa, I'm going to let you know that it is, for whatever reason, there we go. Okay. There you go. It looks like it's working now. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So I often start by noting that the, that the field of educational consulting continues to, to grow. Uh, and note that the growth that we've seen over the last decade or two is not slowing down at all. Uh, but there is a big change. Notice what I say here at the very top. The growth of late has been in existing practices. So where independent educational consulting kind of got its footing with people who were sole practitioners, uh, very often working out of a home office, 
doing this on their own. Today, so much of the growth is taking place in existing consulting firms where we see uh, a practice expanding, uh, new IECs joining an existing practice. That used to be probably 10% just uh, a handful of years ago. And today, uh, about a half of all the consultants coming into the field seem to be heading toward joining an existing practice. Well, that tells us a lot. It tells us, most importantly, that demand continues to outpace supply in most parts of the United States. So the demand for great educational consulting uh, continues uh, and, and continues in a great way. Um, it, there are a couple of examples. You know, here I have some gr uh, overall growth in the field numbers there, uh, but, it, but it's worth noting uh, there are even 500 people signed up to listen to me drone on about, uh, about trends in the field. I, I don't think we ever would have gotten those kinds of numbers just a, a few years ago. So let's talk about what some of that growth is really all about. So uh, it is, yes, in part, it is adding a second or third consultant to an existing practice. We certainly see a bunch of that. But it's also adding non-consulting staff, administrative support, adding uh, financial support, meaning someone to do accounting in the books uh, it is something that I see happening a lot. We also see that as people are adding a new consultant, they're often looking for geographic expansion. So a firm that's in central California uh, may add somebody in Northern California, add somebody in San Diego, looking to expand their geographic reach. There, there are some consultants who are bi-coastal. Uh, I'm, I'm always amazed by that, but it is, uh, amazing to see uh, that kind of, of effort. It, 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 one of the things that's so interesting about geographic expansion, for people who like working locally, sometimes that just means somebody uh, who will be located one high school over or located near the local uh, Catholic high school instead of the local public high school. Just anything that will expand the reach just a little bit. You also see that we talk about uh, new service delivery is one of the things that I see that's really interesting. I see consulting firms adding people, somebody who does some work for local charter schools, uh, somebody who uh, does work through uh, workplaces, somebody who is delivering services uh, en masse, sort of using these sorts of technologies to provide services uh, in a bigger way. Uh, the, um, uh, well, let, let's go on, because I also want to talk about sort of the international piece of this, because that's another way that we certainly see geographic, but other sorts of expansion. Uh, notice a couple of things here. Uh, not only is international growing very quickly, I estimate over the last decade there's been about a thousand percent increase uh, in the number of educational consultants working internationally. Uh, I would also say this, uh, look at the second item in my bullets. Uh, agents, meaning those people who are paid on a per head basis, uh, I believe that number peaked about two years ago and we have begun to see a decline. Colleges have begun to realize they were not getting great candidates uh, through compensated agents and they have begun to look toward consultants and others. Uh, we'll probably, IECA will probably introduce our first training program uh, that'll be an internationally based training program uh, within the next couple of years. So we see uh, that kind of growth pretty exciting. I would note that not only do we see the international growth of consulting, uh, there has been a growth in the number of domestic consultants advising kids globally. I think the last time we surveyed members just a couple years ago, 
about two thirds of our members say they're now working with at least one international student. And that may not seem shocking to anybody, but 10 years ago, rather than it being 70%, it probably would have been closer to 7%. So the, that international demand, we see more and more members uh, getting involved and more and more consultants, IECs uh, working in that area. Notice there's also a slight growth in the number of domestic placements abroad. So students in the United States looking to study abroad. Over the last year, uh, not only have we been running programs, uh, IECA running uh, college visits in uh, England and other parts of, of the UK, uh, we've been contacted to run programs in New Zealand and Australia and other parts of the, the world as well. And so uh, that's become uh, yet uh, more and more important at the same time. Uh, let's continue a little bit more on expansion because expansion also means what services are offered. By the way, I'm still on, on, on uh, mega trend number one, right? All about expansion. So here I want to talk about sort of expanding the services that are offered specialties provided by consultants. We have more consultants in IECA right now uh, who are working with athletes uh, than we've ever had before. Uh, more consultants that I know, IECA and HECN unaffiliated consultants, working with artists than ever before, working with students with learning disabilities and kids that are gifted uh, are, and twice exceptional students. There are these niche expertise areas that I see firms are able to deal with. And so what I, I guess I would describe it the following way over the last few years. You know, if a, if a practice is full, meaning they've reached whatever maximum they've established for themselves, and they decide we're going to add an additional uh, person uh, to, uh, to the practice, well, why not add somebody with a very unique expertise? Maybe it's grad school. Maybe it's, it's career exploration. Uh, you know, maybe it is... Uh, I even know a practice that specializes in student athletes that won't be uh, starting at a Division I school. So people are looking for these interesting sorts of, of expertise because it's a way to really make a practice uh, just be able to serve such a larger and broader uh, group of, of students. I think, by the way, so exciting because uh, it, it lends itself to a, 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 uh, a, a professional field where people really begin to rely on each other, that they know that expertise. So uh, to me, that, that's just a, a terrific um, uh, that's just the terrific development in the field as, as members begin to help and mentor each other and learn some of these, these other fields. One more uh, item as we talk about expansion. You know, we've talked about hiring new ed consultants. The other trend that I also see are hiring outside experts so that we see firms that may not be uh, bringing on another consultant but they're gonna bring on someone. And we all know there are, there are a few people out there uh, doing uh, great work just in essays. Uh, I know a consulting firm that uh, it brings in an outside group just to work on getting students ready for interviews. And I, I, I have some feelings about that because we know interviews are important at some places and not others. But tell me, this isn't terrific. I know a consulting practice that if a student is sort of on the spectrum, just a little bit uh, having difficulty with social interaction, imagine being able to work with them with an expert in nonverbal learning disabilities or with uh, autism spectrum disorders who can talk to students about those interview skills. And you see two things, one, doing great work using an outside expert to do it. And at the same time, the consulting firm becomes even better known for great work that it's able to provide families. 
And one of the things that we know is families of students often with these unique situations, sometimes that's just, you know, it's the, the drama club kids and sometimes it's sports and sometimes it's LD. Those parents tend to be so involved in the life of, of a school that sharing information about a consultant with that kind of expertise really seems to happen a great deal. I'm going to add one more that I don't have listed here, but that I'd met, that I'd want to bring up, and that is uh, social media. Uh, we know that the number of companies, uh, Social Assurity is one that comes to mind right off the bat, who have emerged in the last couple of years that either help students uh, clean up their uh, their social media, or who help them develop content for use in social media. Uh, and without getting into the, the a moral judgment on those, those are kind of the areas that I see being hired from outside. So my bottom line on expansion really is, not only are there more consultants, consulting firms are expanding like never before. That has meant increased specialization, increased opportunities for new IECs that are really interested in counseling but not business, and improved services for kids and families, uh, all of which I consider to be just particularly terrific. My second mega trend is to talk about what I see as a corporatization of the field of consulting. Now, that implies for some that, it, that there's a standardization uh, going forward, and that big business is entering the field of consulting. So let me say yes to both of those. Uh, not that they're taking over, uh, but there is some of that going on. We see for the first time online, you know, one day workshops on how to be uh, an, an educational consultant. Uh, we have new books out. Uh, probably the uh, uh, the leader in this field, Steve Antonoff, of course, has a brand new book out, uh, which is essentially the first textbook on how to become an educational consultant. We see uh, folks like Jamie Dickinson uh, running uh, boot camps on educational consulting. And part of the result of all these is there has been a growing standardization. Now, that is good and bad. Uh, it's, it's good that we have sort of developed a best practices in the field. And certainly at our Summer Training Institute, we talk a great deal about best practices in the field. But it also means that we see that, that the evolution of language, that we're all using the same words. We're, we're, we're using uh, so many other uh, 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 descriptions of a consulting practice uh, that, I, that I worry that there's a growing sameness, which is an odd thing to say because a minute ago I talked about specialization. So while we ought to be able to be talking about our uniqueness and, and what we offer, I'm a little concerned uh, that that growing sameness in describing uh, the field. I will tell you that we get the complaint often in the office that someone has stolen my language uh, from, the, from my website. And when we go and look, the language that's being taken are things like uh, that it's about best fit, not getting into a name brand college. Well, those have become phrases that we're all using now. Uh, but, but also, let me talk about how there is a growing library of courses and books and websites where you can learn the field, uh, some much better than others, uh, but it's certainly helping people just begin to make a transition in the field. Uh, although I am a little concerned when folks do it just from a book or just from a website or just from an online course, you've got to meet those folks. And I know in UCI and I know at STI and some other places, and I apologize for all the initials, that you're meeting your classmates 
who become your professional peers in the future. And that is just so important uh, for everyone. Uh, I will though say, uh, when I talk about the, uh, the corporatization or the growing uh, trends or standardization, very often as these, uh, as these uh, uh, larger firms develop, so take a firm with four, five, or six uh, consultants, uh, that there is going to be a natural tend tendency to standardize the delivery of services. You can't have employees, six or seven consultants in a firm, or in the case of, a, of some firms, especially in the West Coast, that may have many more than that, 40 or 50 consultants. You simply can't have everyone doing it their own way. Uh, it, the firm becomes stronger by offering a consistency in the materials and the package that's done. I see that somebody is asking the question, you know, what are the cons to that corporatization? And I, I think that the, the con that I see is that if we make it possible for people to take a course and open a shop, uh, and, and I mean literally take a $400 online two-hour training and then open up a consulting practice, to be fair, they don't know anything yet. Uh, if they haven't been on tours and they haven't done those things and they didn't develop a, a, a group of, of colleagues and professionals to join with them, I'm just not sure how strong they will be as uh, an ed consultant. So, uh, I, 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 so I guess I'm a little concerned. I also believe that one of the strengths in the field is how people are able to offer different types of services. When a parent calls the office, and then I'll move on, but I wanna make sure I've answered this person fairly, uh, I guess Peter, uh, it, it, that when a person calls the office, when they say, can you recommend a consultant to us? I hope you realize our answer is, well, of course I can't. I could recommend a whole group of consultants, but if a family says it's a kid who is very quiet and reserved, they need someone to draw him out a little bit, that we begin to learn, well, we begin in our own minds to separate different consultants that we know. So I love that way of individualizing a consulting practice that I just think is, is important. So I, I, I hope that answered that, and uh, Charlotte, good to see you as well. Okay. Uh, let me uh, go on. Uh, that didn't happen. There we go. So let me, let me say this, and I've been saying for years that students are at all levels are more complicated, and every time I think I've exhausted the, the, the uh, topic, kids get yet more complicated. But I actually think that starting today, I'm going to, instead of saying that students are more complicated, I'd rather say that advising students has become more complicated. And, and let me talk about what I mean by the ways in, in which they've become more complicated. You know, we now have pervasive uh, amounts of depression and anxiety. We've got kids on the spectrum. We're dealing with LD and N NLD. Uh, but there's even religious and ethnic diversity. And that's not to say that that makes a kid complicated, but it makes delivery of services. If you have a student for the first time who looks at you and says, I want to go to a campus that has halal possibilities for me. Uh, it, it complicates the process. You suddenly need to know more about services offered on campus or just off campus. Uh, the students who will say to you, I will pray seven times a day. Is there a place that I'm going to be able to do that on campus? So all of those kinds of diversity. I remember a few years ago at Summer Institute, somebody said, oh yes, I've, I've got my first uh, student from South America and I know, and I don't even remember what they said after that because my brain froze. Because we know that, that every single country and culture in South and Central America is different from one another. So knowing how to serve this kind of ethnic diversity 
uh, in our population. Kids from Mexico and kids from Puerto Rico and kids from Bolivia and kids from other places are so different than one another. Just the students that, that may be Asian, they are different from one another and, uh, and cu with cultural differences. But being able to speak their language is so important. It's also more complicated because of the pressure that kids feel to be accepted early. They want to be done with this by Christmas break, for God's sakes. We used to think of that as something that was unique and special. Now, every kid just wants to be done early. Affordability, I think, has become a more complicating matter, not only because the rules keep changing, but I think that a few years ago, uh, there there were a, a, a pool of kids that didn't have to worry about the affordability issue. Today, I'm hearing from consultants uh, within and without uh, IECA, I'm hearing that everybody talks about affordability. Everybody wants to know about merit aid. Everybody knows that become a complication. And I, there are a few of us out here that are in the age group that most of us are in. I'll just say adulthood and beyond. Uh, there are a few of us that are as knowledgeable about gender identity issues as we probably need to be. Uh, and I don't care how open you are. How do you demonstrate that openness? Do you know how comfortable students will be at different campuses? Uh, do you know about not only acceptance, but be kids being fully integrated into campus community. Uh, do you know how colleges show their acceptance uh, in the admissions office? If you have a student who is gender fluid or you have a student who is transgendered, will they walk into an admissions office and feel that they belong? So I think that I, I, my point simply is that we have to accept the fact that, that uh, it's it simply become a much more complicated uh, process. But I also wanna go a little bit further into the diversity issue. And one thing I wanna say about diversity is I am beyond pleased that we are beginning to diversify as a profession. I, I, I honestly couldn't have said that a few years ago. And uh, so, and when I talk about diversity here, again, I'm talking racial diversity, gender uh, identity. In every way possible, we are beginning to look a little bit more like our clients, although we've really are, are just beginning at that. And I also want to note when I talk about diversity, I, I talk about diversity the same way colleges do geographic diversity, social class diversity, you know, all of those things are important. I remember uh, when Elon uh, used to say that they were sort of a regional college with students from usually about 12 to 15 colleges. And today, Elon gets students from 50 states. So, they credit educational consulting. They actually credit, they credit IECA consultants who have learned about the school. I just say part of that is kids who have grown up uh, with the internet and know that there are possibilities from them from, from sea to shining sea. And how exciting uh, that these kids are open uh, to going to colleges that, that fit them, where they belong anywhere in the country. But, you know, so there's some geographic diversity in that as well. So uh, I want to say one more thing, though, about diversity. I think that's really uh, critically important. You know, you, we often hear people talk about the fact uh, that certain states, and we hear California and Texas and New Mexico are getting close to being majority, minority, and all of that. Forget that. Let me talk about national numbers for a minute. Find your own age group here. Chances are most of us on this call, somewhere between 60 and 75% of the people in our age group are Caucasian. Now look 
at the post millennials. That's the next group of students that we're going to be serving. That number is already at 50%. Look at the Hispanic numbers at the top of that. How in our age group, my age group, I'll talk about myself overall, it's about 10% is Hispanic. But of the young people who will be our clients, that figure is already around 23 or 24%. So this isn't a change of the future. This is a change now. And I worry about consultants who don't think it's affecting them because it absolutely is. And so doing more for cultural understanding, doing more to demonstrate an openness. Uh, note, please, by the way, that the, I, one of the reasons I like using this chart, even though it's a couple years old at this point, is it's a chart that's begun to recognize people that are multiple race uh, individuals because we often don't, and we ask kids to choose which one. Watch that number grow in the next few years. That's going to be a very significant number uh, over the next decade, according to all social scientists. So the changing ethnic and racial diversity is not something only to think about toward the future. I think it's something we have got to deal with uh, in the here and now. Uh, uh, and I, I'm sorry, I, I shouldn't have done this, I know. I took a minute to read some of the, the questions and I promise that we're gonna to get to uh, the questions as, as best we possibly could, uh, as best I can. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm uh, just falling all over my words. Uh, again, I'm having a little problem forwarding. Mark, let me see if I can bring the uh, <clears throat> PowerPoint slides back up and Hold on real quick. Okay, you may have to click on the slide itself to activate the remote control, and then you should be able to move them. And we shall see. Does the arrow key on your keyboard, does that, that might work. There you go. Okay, uh, I apologize to everybody, and as always, uh, Lisa Waring, thank you so much. No uh, <laughs> so, Number four out of my uh, top six uh, is, is, is this a conundrum that we face, right? We would all agree that admission decisions are less predictable than they used to be. So what happens when consultants who for years prided themselves on being able to guess and say to a family, this is a stretch, this is a sure bet, uh, here's a target school for you. I'm really feeling good about these. If when I know when consultants get together and I listen into conversations, people will say, boy, I had a really difficult time with Wash U this year, or it was really tough. I can't figure out Drexel this year or, or wherever it is that, that the decision seemed to be confounding because then somebody else jumps in and says, really? Because I had a pretty mediocre kid who got in there this year. And it, and it just throws everybody. And yet, you're selling yourselves to families as an expert. And I think it's going to mean that almost immediately, everybody doing this work should be thinking about the language that they use with families that they are about helping kids with the admission process. They are not about getting anywhere close, nowhere close uh, to, to predicting uh, where a student gets in, where they don't. There's a consultant I often talk about just because she does such, something so different and it used to be really unique and I think it's sort of catching on. Uh, working with, with students, she would never identify schools that were reach, target, uh, and, and safety. She would simply give kids an alphabetical list. And as you know, students would typically say, well, which ones are, are pretty safe and which ones are gonna be tough? She would say, let me worry about that. Your job is to see where you'd like to go. And she'd have them research and figure out colleges that look great. Now her job was to try to arrange a good group of colleges, but suddenly it became less about, will I get into any of the REACH schools? Am I gonna to have to settle? 
Instead, kids just had an alphabetical list of schools that they liked that they applied to in the end. I don't know if we need to be doing that, but I think that, that we have to think about the language we use with families because I think it's be going to become less and less predictable who gets into, uh, into uh, any particular college. Um, and part of the reason, of course, is we're dealing with changes uh, about how admission decisions are made. The first one I'm going to mention isn't even on there. Committee decision making, I guess, has become all the rage. Uh, it, folks from Swarthmore and other colleges, uh, Jim Bach, I guess there, have been uh, sort of leading uh, the, the smaller liberal arts schools in, in that sort of uh, committee-based decision making. Um, but, but there are certainly other things going on. The use of technology and modeling. Uh, I go on that NACAC uh, exhibit hall floor and think about uh, when I first started going, I, there was nobody. People were selling uh, email lists or, or, or address, actual street address lists to colleges, but it wasn't like every other vendor was selling a computer-based modeling program for universities. Uh, we have to think about how quickly we're going to test optional. Uh, I feel like every day somebody else is announcing that they're test optional uh, and how that is changing admission decisions. Uh, the changing uh, reliance on ED and AD that I mentioned. Um, I think that there is a renewed interest in character things like grit and determination and all that. Well, how are they being played in the admission decision? We don't know exactly how those are being used at different colleges. And let me just say how we really don't know uh, two things, demonstrated interest that I've listed at the bottom, but also how social media is playing a role. We think we do, we advise kids better safe than sorry. Uh, so, uh, I, I, what I would, I would just say is uh, we have to know more about how colleges are making decisions so that we can advise families on the uncertainty of the application process. Somebody said, and I loved it, by the way, oh, it's Lloyd, my friend Lloyd, uh, that I just described consulting when I talked about uh, getting families away from the admission decision. Uh, so I would never disagree with anything Lloyd says uh, publicly. I know you'd appreciate that, Lloyd, saying the word publicly. So uh, let's go on. Number five on my list is simply the total amount of information. Every time I think we are totally, totally overloaded by technology, uh, it, more comes along. There is simply too much information. The information comes at us too often. I remember when I made a decision that I love Twitter. And let me just say it precedes uh, the President of the United States and his love for Twitter. I, I, I loved it. And I immediately put every college in the United States I started to follow on Twitter. Can you imagine how quickly that grew old? Unless I sat in front of my computer all day long looking for announcements of information, there was no way to keep up with simply the rate of change, the rate of new information coming in. Uh, it, it, how do you keep up? And, as, and you note there, I'd like saying the clients, unfortunately, they'll go online and they'll see something come across. I was on a, a conference call a couple days ago uh, with some folks talking about the WACAC uh, super conference that's coming up. And uh, I think it was Bucknell. Somebody said, oh, look, Bucknell just went test optional. Well, you simply can't keep up with stuff in real terms, but there will be a parent who will call you and say, did you know that? And they expect you to know everything. And you absolutely have to, uh, have to note that it's impossible to keep up with. Having said that, let's, let's talk about the positives, right? is that if we can become masters of this technology and we can integrate it all, that we can keep in a single place 
client records and office management and billing and uh, test results. And we can communicate with students, communicate with families. Uh, we can see kids uh, during parts of the school day when they can connect with us based on the web or kids out of our region, out of our area, out of the country. Uh, and so there is it, simply so much, you know, Peter, you're right, that we want to embrace that level of change. The fear I think I hear from most consultants is, how do I find what is worthwhile and valued and what just is going to take yet more of my time? And I think it's, it's figuring out uh, what are those, which of those things will work for you. Because if we figure out how to master these technologies, then you can see more clients, right? If you go through, here's my best example. If you go through a basic discussion with every individual student that explains merit aid, let's just say you do that, that explains the difference between merit aid and need-based aid. Imagine if you could just record that in a great little Zoom conference, and then every student views it on their own, then you deal, then you just deal with the questions that arise. Well, now you free time to see more clients. If you can share information with clients overall, if you can bring in experts, if you can share information from, with colleagues, for colleagues, and from colleagues, uh, it increases collaboration. So there simply is so much that you can do if we master technology. I'm gonna note on that, that chart uh, there on the right side of your screen, uh, that there was a time not that long ago where almost 100% of clients were seen locally. That's half now. Half of all clients are seen outside of one's own community. That is a profession that is fundamentally changing. Uh, and, and I think in an exciting way. It means we can reach kids in communities and neighborhoods where a consultant isn't present. And it means that we can uh, work with kids uh, at different hours in different ways uh, and reach all sorts of, of, of new clients in, in exciting ways. Now, I have a couple of slides here that talk about fees, and I, I, that's my sixth item, and I'm going to try to zip through it a bit. I first have to say for a legal reason that anything I talk about with fees is based on historical data and not based on current data. That would be price fixing and against the law. And so let me just talk about a couple of things. You can see that there was, again, if I went back five, six, seven years ago, 90% of people would tell me that they only charge based on a package of services. They do a package fee. Very few said hourly, maybe about five to 10% about where it is now. But you'll also see that the big number of people are those that do both. In fact, many of those people do a whole variety of options. They do mini packages. They have a menu of services. They have add-on services. That, that your, the package covers the, the common app, uh, maybe something else, and you can add on services for other things. So I think that there are uh, new ways of, of helping. And by the way, it is a wonderful thing. Because if we were only offering packages as a profession, then we would only be serving families that could come up with thousands and thousands of dollars. Instead, because we're working hourly or in small packages, we are able to serve many, many more families than we used to. It's the reason that most families working with consultants are public school families uh, working in uh, suburban, urban uh, areas, a little less in rural areas, but primarily public school families. So it, it, it's a great thing. Here are some numbers for you because I know you're going to want them and it's why you're going to end up printing out the, this uh, presentation. So where do hourly, where did, oh God, I almost got myself arrested. Where did hourly fees stand uh, as 2018 came to, 
came to a close. Well, the average was about $200 an hour. There are many consultants that charge more for the first hour or the first session is two hours because it's an intake, but about $200 an hour is, is about the average, although you can see a huge range. And I would say that's a range that will take you from Louisiana to Manhattan or San Francisco. Of course, there are some that are outside that range. That is not an inclusive. That's about where most people are. Uh, and again, the number of people who are willing to work on an hourly basis, that is the fastest uh, growing group, but they're not doing it exclusively. I also want to show some historic data for those comprehensive packages. In the last year, the average fee charged in the United States has climbed above $4,000 and is $4,000 or more in every one of the regions. Uh, and you'll see, as always, New England has led the way. Uh, part of the reason it's a little lower in the West than I know looking at, at, at names of, of friends and, and colleagues that I know popping up here, many of you are California. California may be the area where the constant influx of large numbers of new untrained consultants charging far less is probably depressing the overall cost of consulting. I think that will begin to increase a little bit in the years ahead as some of those people either disappear or get with the program and learn a little bit more. You'll also see the increased cost for international owing to the fact that uh, it is a more complicated process to work with a family that's international. Now, I do have to say a quick word about that. Please note, it isn't a million dollars. It's not even a half a million dollars. I know that news stories like to, to talk about serving these international kids are, are unbelievable amounts. And we know that internationally, there are places where it is not uncommon, especially in China, for those fees to be closer to ten to $20,000. But most kids can get somebody to do the services uh, less than that. Those are my six areas, but I have a couple of bonus uh, things to point out to you, and I'll try to do it quickly so there's time for questions. One, we asked in a survey of members last year, where's your greatest area of, uh, 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 where do you feel exposed as a consultant? And we have, I often say consulting has, there's knowledge, there's counseling, and there's business. Uh, the knowledge of campuses and schools, running the office, and uh, counseling skills. And as you can see, that number for counseling has stayed about the same. Business is where most people are concerned, but believe it or not, the fastest growing piece is the knowledge piece. And, and it goes right to the anxiety that so many consultants feel about keeping up with the constant change of information. We did also ask uh, members, and I want to caution you, this is an odd chart, because we asked people to tell us what are their concerns and challenges, and people could give multiple answers. So if you look at the upper right, running a profitable business, well, that's about half of consultants. It looks like a little or a smaller, littler. Uh, uh, my communications manager is going to yell at me when this is done. Uh, it's a smaller piece of that pie. Uh, that is what it looks like, but it represents. Uh, so look at the numbers rather than the, the chunk of the pie. And I want to point out a couple of uh, things that I find really interesting. The sheer volume of information that keeps coming up. When I discuss where IECA needs to head uh, from our point of view, how do we help our members synthesize information, get them what's important? Some of you know, I know most of the people online aren't members of IECA. Those that are know that we went from just our usual newsletter published every other month to now publishing news and information every single Monday morning. What do you have to know this week as a way to try to communicate the most topical information that we can? Uh, the in Increased complexity of kids that we talked about is there in a significant way. But I also want to point out on the left, it's great to do this on a day that the president is in Vietnam and uh, the hearings are taking place on the Hill. The changing political and economic climate in the United States is, at, is a major area of concern for educational consultants. There is a worry that especially for international students, 
that the United States no longer looks like the great land of, of opportunity and welcoming uh, tone. But when you ask international students uh, where they want to go to college, and if you bring up the United States, the number one reason that they are saying they don't want to come here, I know a lot of you right now are thinking of a name of a person. That's not it. It's guns. Gun violence is so affecting kids internationally that it is something we're going to have to think about. Well, Lisa, I'm going to uh, hand it over to you because I'm, I'm, I'm hoping there's a question or two that we can get to. I'm sorry I went a little bit longer than I had planned to. No, no worries at all. You shared some very, very valuable information. For those of you who are logged in, feel free to use the chat panel. Mark, if you want to take a minute to just scroll through your chat panel to see if any questions stand out to you. Um, I do want to address, there were a couple questions about the recording of the webinar. And yes, we will be sending out the recording of the webinar. It will be posted to our UCI Division of Continuing Education YouTube page, but we will also be able, we will also be sending it directly to all of you who have, who registered for the webinar. We will be sending that in an email either later this week or early next week. So keep an eye out for the webinar recording link and you'll be able to have that to review um, the presentation over again. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I, I noticed that somebody had talked about, wouldn't it be great for associations? Maybe we should be running some sessions in Spanish at conferences. At the very least, there should not be a single conference that goes by that we are not doing something on improving cultural understanding, gender identity issues. We have got to be helping members to better understand the students that they work with. Uh, I have to ask, and I'm sorry, I can't see all the names. It looks like maybe Jill. Am I wrong to see this as the most competitive in the most competitive schools? Uh, of course, you asked that at a time that probably made a great deal of sense. Uh, and so I'm not exactly clear, but I share with you a concern that we are seeing kids, you're saying uber prepared. I would say kids that have been overstressed uh, overworked and are overwrought while still in high school thinking that the admission letter is the be all and end all. And I am concerned that these kids arrive at college burned out and it's not going to get any better once they get there. Lisa, do you see something that? Let me scroll through. I think a lot of them we were able to touch on while you were presenting. Oh, uh, the, I, okay, I just saw that, that, that the specific comment was about the being able to predict who gets in and not. Uh, is that mostly the most competitive schools? I, obviously, schools that are the least competitive are going to continue to accept uh, the vast majority of its applicants, and, and we'll know that. So I think I'm talking about not, not just the top tier, and probably not just to the next 10%, but maybe to the, to the top 30% of colleges that it's simply become less predictive. Part of that is because we have, these kids are filing so many applications. I, I saw in one of the uh, chat, uh, maybe the, the, the um, independent consultant Facebook page, somebody talking about a student submitting 36 applications. I'm glad I don't know who the consultant was because I'm kind of thinking that that's malpractice. Uh, although it's a family's decision, of course, how many to do. But anyway, and I love the use of wild cards. I know uh, uh, Steve Antonoff uses that phrase, wild cards, and many others. Uh, but you were going to, Lisa, did you have a uh, question? Um, scrolling through, let's see. Somebody asked about lawsuits. Can I, I, I so let me just put some, some people at ease. I know of, of many lawsuits that have been threatened about educational consultants from parents. I don't know a single one, and I've been here again 26 years, not one that's been successful. So I wouldn't let that bother you. Uh, I would make sure that I'm always giving advice, I'm giving information from my own knowledge base, but I'm not making predictions.
Great. It looks like we've addressed most of the questions. If, if anyone thinks of a question later on, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, I'd be happy to forward your question on to Mark um, regarding anything presented in this webinar. Again, a recording will be sent out. So if you think of a question, even while watching the recording, feel free to reach out to us. Um, I hope all of you logged in, enjoyed the webinar, and gained some insight into the mega trends reshaping this industry, as well as our IEC certificate program. Hopefully, you saw some courses that piqued your interest. Um, again, spring registration is open. Classes in the program do fill up very quickly. So if you are interested in taking a spring course, uh, please make sure you register um, as soon as possible. And this slide has my contact information as well as my director. So again, feel free to contact us with any question. Thank you again, Mark. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks for joining us for this webinar. Thank you, everybody. Nice to see some friends uh, zipping by in the chat room. <laughs> Thank you all. <laughs> Have a great day.